If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything that you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on any listening platform like Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. It's everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to the Wartime Leadership Podcast, where we explore what spiritual resiliency looks like from different perspectives. We often focus on the physical, emotional, and social areas of resiliency, but often neglect the spiritual pillar. Now, this looks different for everyone. We will be exploring what spiritual resiliency looks like in the lives of our guests, who are people from all different walks of life. Today's episode is sponsored by Success Draft, where we help you transform your dreams into drafted plans. Head over to successdraft.com to get started on your future today. This episode's guest is one of somebody that I consider a friend, somebody that has poured into me throughout my career. Uh, when I was a brand new military training instructor, uh, he was kind of one of those individuals that we looked up to as new instructors to see what it was that we were supposed to be doing. And let me tell you, he did it great. Devin was the type of individual that would scare the living crap out of trainees and then just walk over to us all so kindly and calmly and introduce himself. It's what we all kind of looked up to. Devin is now an instructor with the Non-Commissioned Officer Academy back down at San Antonio, Texas. Devin, how are you doing? Man, I am doing good. I am pumped. I'm pumped to be here. I'm glad to get to share part of my life and my story. And that was a pretty sweet intro. Uh, appreciate that. And I look forward to actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about my MTI dude later, but I'm doing good, man. I'm good. I'm on paternity leave, hanging out with my family, chilling. Now, if there's anything that we know in the military, it's that if you haven't grown facial hair in a really long time, it becomes harder and harder and comes mm-hmm. in kind of splotchy. But man, you you got a good, sweet little stash going on I there. I get a stash. I got spotty on the sides, like nothing, but, you know, I, I can get a stash going. It's pretty dark. <laughs> you should probably keep it. <laughs> All right. Hey, so ladies and gentlemen, tonight, today's episode is just going to absolutely be fun because we're going to be able to play off of one another quite well. Uh, Devin's got a pretty sweet story with, with how he met his wife and kind of the, the starting of his family uh, while dealing with some stuff, uh, ex- especially, I mean, a difficult time in the military to be able to, to start a family. But before we get going, uh, Devin, why don't you kind of bring us a little bit, take us back, kind of bring us up to this, this point in your life, kind of what, what has happened uh, through your career or or through your personal life, bringing you here to this moment now. Um, do you want me to start like from birth or just kind of as of recent? You know what? You you take us where you think you need to. All right, go. Cool. Uh, I'll just give you a snapshot. So, so I joined the Air Force straight out of high school. I was still eighteen. Uh, I've actually been in the Air Force for fourteen and some change now. Fourteen years and some, I think nine months. Um, <clears throat> I met my wife when I was at MTI here at Lackland Air Force Base. Sometime, somehow, I found time to meet a wife, <laughs> find a wife, and uh, uh, I lucked out for sure. Um, we got married in 2016. Um, just no, 2015. I left MTI duty in 2016 to go to Florida. Uh, while we were in Florida, we had three girls. Uh, and before we PCS again from Florida to DC, we got pregnant again and we had our fourth girl uh, while I was stationed in Washington, DC. Um, and then uh, I was supposed to go to Germany, actually. I was supposed to be there right now. 
Um, and we can dive into this later if you want. But uh, I was supposed to be in D.C. Or not in D.C. I was in D.C. I was supposed to be in Germany right now, but that assignment got deferred due to EFMP, or if people don't know what it is, the Exceptionally Mem Exceptional Family Member Program in the Air Force. Uh, went all the way through some training, and they said, hey, you can't go. And so they sent me here. And now I'm at Lackland Air Force Base again, uh, which is kind of cool because my I know people here. I'm familiar with the area, and my, all of my wife's family's here. So I'm here now as a as a PME instructor at the Gale NCO Academy. And it, it makes it good for you being back kind of in that home environment for your wife, you know, to have people be able to come around her and support her, the girls and you. Uh, I know that there's plenty of the people that you and I both know that are still at Lackland uh, doing different jobs, which is kind of yep. cool to, to be able to still have that uh, that foundation of people. Yeah, I've actually ran into three or four people already and I've been on leave half the time I've been here so far. Uh, yeah, it's been really cool, especially awesome. the month of May. Uh, half of my family's birth, half of my wife's family's birthdays revolve around May, and it's Mother's Day, and so it's a big month for her family. So it's cool that we got to be here in time for the month of May. Man, that's cool. Hey, so why don't we start off with five easy questions? I'm telling you, these are the softballs for the entire day that we're going to go. So they're just cool. going to kind of warm us up and and get us into this conversation. Uh, what is one thing that you find repulsive? So I've listened to your podcast before, and every time you ask this, I'm like, what is repulsive to me? And up to this point, I've been saying vomit. Like, I'm a sympathy vomiter. Like, I can't <laughs> stand it. Oh. Uh, you know, I was there for all my wife's pregnancies. No problem. See it all. Good to go. But as soon as, like, when my kids feel sick and throwing up, I'm like, mm -mm, babe, you got to... <laughs> Mm -mm. You got to go over there. But as of recent, man, uh, we have tons of flies and I put some fly traps mm. out. Dude, those things smell so bad. Oh, gosh. I, I can't be around. And now, 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 Texas doesn't have just regular flies. Like everything is larger oh, in man. Texas. Hey, yeah, that's true. Oh, that's, it's nasty. So, yeah. So, I mean, so that's weird. Now, you're, I would have probably said like Alabama football. Repulsive, oh, right? No, oh, no. The others, the other one, we won't mention it. Their team <laughs> colors are blue and orange. They got two different mascots. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Y'all got to understand. Devin is a huge Bama fan. Like every Roll single family, well, every single family photo that this man has, <laughs> I swear he's wearing that that typical Sunday outfit for Alabama. Like it's got the the red polo with the white A mm -hmm. on. I mean, come on, dude. I'm Every still, single I should one. Should have brought my hat and worn it in the video, even though no one's watching. <laughs> yeah, that's good because uh, they wouldn't see it. Uh, what is one thing that is in your online shopping cart that you have not purchased yet? Man, I don't shop online. I don't. I don't have anything in a right. cart. Well, what, what's in your wife's cart? I don't know. It's probably some baby item. She every day, I, just today, the past three days, there's been something at the door every time I walk outside. Uh, I would say the last thing I did buy online, I think, was um, some camping gear, probably like a primitive tarp. I love to go camping and being outside, so there's probably some rope and stuff like that. <laughs> I think that's the last thing I actually bought online. All right, that actually makes a lot of sense. Knowing you, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so then what is one thing that you love about your job? It's like stimulating. It's stimulating to be around people. Um, some people probably would laugh if they heard me say hmm. that. But uh, it's cool to, always, with new people, each class, it's new people, kind of like basic training. Every six to seven weeks, you have a brand new set of people you're working with. And there's something always different. It's always exciting or terrible. I don't mean, BMT maybe is a little terrible, but it's always exciting. And so I, I just like that ability to hear people's stories and also share my story. And we can kind of just, grow together based on things that we've done in life and that have been through see that you're a lot like me uh i like how you said working with you have a lot of different because in the classroom you don't typically think you think the teacher approach right like like mm -hmm. i am the teacher you're the students you're going to hear but in our career fields that's a little bit different you you want a conversation where people learn yeah, yeah. from one another so it's really cool to hear you say working with people different people every six, seven weeks. So that's really, that's a good outlook to have on it. So what is one thing that you would leave 
your current job for? Hands down, if I could work from home and have my own woodworking shop, uh, I would I would probably just be like I'm out. Mm-hmm. Peace. Like if uh, I've probably bought enough rigid tools from Home Depot that I probably own half the company. If they would just come one day and email and say, hey, we're going to sponsor you and you will pay for all the stuff. You just build it. I'd be like, all right, let's go. You know, I love, uh, I like woodworking. So, I mean, I'm looking around the room. I, I built our, our a farmhouse bed for us to sleep on our TV downstairs. I'm working on a tree house out in the back. So, but yeah, I would be like, I'm out. Let's go. Dude, that is awesome to hear. All right. So who's your favorite superhero? I like Batman. You know, the typical superhero, I like Batman. He's, I grew up watching DC stuff. He's just a guy with some skills and a lot of money, but <laughs> he's got no superpower. He's just tough. You know, he can't see through things or fly. And he's inventive and intuitive. And yeah, Batman was always my superhero growing up. All right. Hey, you know what? I, I said I was only going to ask you five, but I'll throw out another one out there. Uh, I'm giving you two plane tickets. I'm I'm handing you two plane tickets. One is to a place that you have already been. And another is to somewhere that you have never been. Where are those two tickets to? Easy. So the ticket, I will go back and pass somewhere I've been that I haven't taken my family yet. Um, is my great uncle's house where my grandmother uh, and her brother grew up in Mansfield, Georgia. Hmm. Like a town, everybody knows everybody. There's not even a stoplight. It's just a train track and a stop sign. Um, country as can be. It's a dirt road. I just remember going there as a kid. My family would go there on like spring break or in the summertime. It's just quiet and it's country as you can get. And I just remember being out there with my grandparents and my mom and dads or stepdad and just having a blast. And so I'd love to take my family there. Sounds like really good fond memories. Yeah, it, it really was. It's a really cool place. Really cool place. Mansfield, Georgia. Uh, the other place I haven't been to that I would love to go to is uh, Die Schweiz, or as we say in English, Switzerland. I think that's probably one of the coolest freaking countries. I mean, it's just beautiful. You know, it's one of the screensaver countries. You can go anywhere in the country and it's like take a picture of random and it's going to be perfect for a screensaver or a postcard. postcard. Um, and they're also, I'm a big train guy. I oh, love man. trains. And so they get their train system is just off the chain. So I would love to go there and just hang out for a while and just ride trains. Everywhere. I remember doing a family trip to Lucerne, Switzerland once and sitting and waking up in the morning time and seeing the train go up along the ridge of the mountain mm. and come back down eating chocolate. Like in the morning, I'm like, Oh, this is so good. Like, I would get so big if I lived there. Oh, yeah. Best milk chocolate ever. Golly. That's pretty dang good. That's pretty good. All right, Devin. Hey, how about if you walk us through your leadership style and your leadership perspective, how that has changed with each different job that you've done? So you come from the space world, right? Like you come from space uh, technology. Uh, uh by trade, I'm a one Delta seven now. I think it changed while I was in school. So I was a CST or a three Delta one X one. I think we're a one Delta seven or something now. And for I, the civilian people out there, I'm an IT guy. Uh, I'm an IT guy. I, I make sure your computer works properly. That's the basic translation, but I was at Patrick space force base. Um, so I, we dealt with a lot of space people space stuff yeah i i know you really wanted to say spacemen i know i saw it i saw it on your face you're like space Space men deep space people the the space people all right well how has your leadership developed over going from your regular job in the air force where you were you know you came out of that career field as a staff sergeant and then came over to be an mti back to your career field and now back to another developmental special duty where you're, you, how has it changed and, and adapted to each of those? So when I first put on staff sergeant, um, I, well, 
Well, I put on staff and then went out to be an MTI. I had never, I never got a chance to supervise anybody. Uh, probably had staff on for maybe like five months before I went to go be an MTI. So my uh, experience of supervising someone was non-existent. <laughs> I went to go supervise 60 people. And the, so I grew up as a you know, staff sergeant growing up, learning that, hey, when I supervise someone, I'm going to be up in their face and tell them what to do. And, you know, that, that was perfect for bmt to a degree mm-hmm. to a degree. Uh, over time um when i got done with mti duty went back to the career field you know sadly still being that's how i was raised as a, a staff sergeant was that's that's how you lead and that is not the case with other people uh, peers and uh, things that need anywhere basically that's not in bmt um, and so it, my leadership style, I would say, has changed over the years, which I think is good. Uh, if, if you're not adapting or changing, especially if it's not good, then that's, that's not a good thing if you're not um, adapting or receiving or you know, acknowledging the feedback people give you. Mm-hmm. But I would say I'm in a new environment. I start off probably as a, I think the technical term is authoritarian. You know, I like to say, hey, here's expectations. I'll even, you know, I definitely, I'm a big believer of I will walk the walk. I don't just talk the talk. I will, I will show you an example. And we do that in BMT when we were in MTI or when we were in MTI. You know, hey, this is how you make a dust cover bed. Now go do. And then if you don't, I'm going to hold you accountable. Uh, and then I try to go into the transactional. I think it's transactional. Like, hey, I want to reward you for your great work. I don't just... I want you to make sure, I want you to know that I'm, I'm happy with what you're doing. But then at the same time, if you, there's an award for doing what you're supposed to do, then there's some sort of disciplinary action, disciplinary action for not meeting the standard. And I think balancing what that looks like, um, it has taken me some time and I'm still working on it because I haven't actually had a chance to lead a group of people in, in at least two or three years due to where I've been assigned. I've been like a one man, one man deep. I would say uh, I've grown more to be able to realize like, hey, people are people and they got stuff going on. And, um, somewhere in there, you got to balance expectations and rewards and um, disciplinary actions. And it, it can be challenging. Be challenging. You know, it's like you said, there, there, was, there was feedback being given to you and you weren't receiving it and acting a, a, about it. So how, what, what event took place that made you finally kind of have to snap? Sadly to say, I think I just heard one too many times negative feedback uh, about maybe how I interacted with some people. And uh, it just took me a while to go, maybe it's me, <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. you know, like, what am I doing? And, you know, like really stop and think, you know, not like one instance, stop and think, but like over a period of time, constantly having to reflect and being like, all right, well, like, all right, I had this interaction with this person today and it didn't go well. What did I do? Mm-hmm. Was it me? Was it my tone? Cause I've been told over the years, not as much recently, my tone uh, is a big one. Not that I, I don't cuss people out. I'm not a big believer in like cussing out or name calling, but I'm all about like, you are wrong. And I'm going to tell you how you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just hearing that one too many times and being like, what the heck? Like, I don't want to be this guy. I don't like being, I don't like receiving that feedback. It's not good. I want to hear like, hey, you really helped us out today. Or, hey, I appreciate the uh, input or blah, blah, blah. You know, see, I want to see, I've been in, yeah, I've been in for 18 years. So we, the, the Air Force that you and I grew up in, in our, in our younger years of being in, is not the way it is now, right? Like the, mm-hmm. the styles have modified and changed so much from, from what we were used to going through, but I've always been flight line, right? Like I'm, I'm on that flight line side and we've always heard the, the, the noners versus the flight liners type deal, you know, that, yeah. that age old <laughs> battle within the air force, uh, noners being people who are on the support side versus the, the flight line people are the mm-hmm. ones quote, making the mission happen. Uh, we can be a little brash with each other on, on that side of, of the world. So I think that the air force that I grew in, grew up in was very much like, hey, just go get it done, get back here. When I went over to the support side, the MTI side, it was it was way different. Like hmm. 
like it, it was still this way with the trainees was very much go do. And then over here with peers, it was very much like, okay, now, now how can I support you? It's, it was, it was weird for mm -hmm. me because I, I know that you saw this in the, uh, in the MTI world. It's, it is a culture where people will help one another and bend over backwards to do it. Yeah. Did you have the same experience? I did over time. I did over time. I, when I went to be an MTI, I volunteered. There wasn't the, the DSD program yet. Uh, I remember being there. It was about my year mark of being an MTI when the, the first, as we call it, the non-balls started showing up. And uh, when I got there, it was like, hey, you better not screw up or we're going to just make your life horrible. And just you're gonna. I mean, there are plenty of times with my first year being like, Why did I volunteer to come down here? <laughs> this sucks, <laughs> you know. Like, I loved being an MTI, but like being treated by my peers, especially those that have been there longer, I'm just like, What the heck is their problem? Like, I'm trying, help me out. And sadly, I think I kind of developed that mentality of as I got older, you know, the non balls, I'm like, Why do you suck? <laughs> it should be better. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that you said that to me a, a couple of times. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I know I wasn't. I know there were. I had my times where I was not a, a fantastic person. Um, I forgot your question. To be <laughs> I know. I knew this was going to happen. I knew I was this like, was going to happen. Did you say with you and me <laughs> sitting down and talking. I knew this was going to happen. But you know, it, just knowing that leadership shift, that leadership ad adjustment that was made, and now that you've gone. You said that now that you've even gone back to your career field, you haven't had that many opportunities to lead mm. larger numbers. Yes. Yeah. So how do you stay accountable? Time. I don't, well, uh, I've told them, so I've been at the, at the actual academy for like three months, maybe. I think I got here mid-March. And I took 10 days of house hunting, and I was there for like two weeks, and now I'm on like six months, and that's six months. Six weeks of paternity leave. <laughs> Like, I haven't even taught a class yet. Uh, they're mm. like, does this dude even want to work? <laughs> yes, I do. It just, <laughs> family comes first. So you guys are second. So I don't know. I, I definitely have told them. I'm like, hey, I one of the people I've sat down with, especially on my supervisor and you know, the commandant, the vice commandant. I'm like, hey, what do you need from us? I'm like, I need feedback. I, I need you to tell me where I'm doing good. But, hey, I like what you did there. I like how you said that. But uh, I also need you to tell me where, like, Hey, what are you doing, Sarnwood? I need you to not do that. Or, hey, how about you try it this way, Sarnwood? And so I just, being right up front with new leadership and peers, saying, hey, I, I want feedback. Uh, this is my new first time here. Um, or I just got here. It's my first time being a DME instructor. And honestly, well, I feel like the expectation, I couldn't tell you how many times someone has been like, oh, you're probably MTI. You got this, you know, teach. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I haven't. Taught peers, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is not the same. I know how to ask questions and redirect and all that. I know how to steer a class, but as far as like everyone talking and talking to a peer, eh, I haven't done that before. So <laughs> I'm a little nervous not like going, everybody's gonna be like, this guy, what's he doing? <laughs> he is so letting us down. Yeah, I know. Please. I'm a little nervous. But all right. So, excited. so given all of this, through your experiences, what you what you have gone through, what comes to mind when I say spiritual resilience? Hmm. Well, I think the easy trap to fall into is just like, oh, spiritual what it means religion or whatever. And for some people, um, that could be it. But uh, I had to look this up. To be honest with you, because I'm like, what? Okay, what's the actual definition of spiritual and resiliency? Okay. And so I kind of came to a conclusion that if your if each person's spirit, let's just say, like there's not a physical part in your body that's called spirit, but I guess most people prefer to the heart, is what makes you have life. And I don't mean like your blood pumping through your veins, uh, veins, but like what makes you feel alive? What makes you feel like life is good to, to, to say things like, Hey man, life, this is a great day. And then resiliency and like being able to bounce back or to adjust from like a hardship or um, troubling times. 
And so when I, when I combine those two together, what is spiritual resiliency to me? It's being able to still see life and have life despite your circumstances. Um, so, wow. um, and being able to adjust mentally, spiritual, obviously spiritually, since that's what we're talking about, what, and be able to adjust yourself, your family, friends, and not let life define, when I say life now, <laughs> I mean like everyday life define what makes you feel alive. Um, so that's spiritual resiliency to me. Wow, that, I mean, there's a lot of power in what you said, right? Like I, I absolutely, being able to still see life through given circumstances, that's that's powerful. And and I liked how you kind of went down and you said in your family and other how so how do you build spiritual resiliency within yourself? Yeah. So I'm a I'm a Bible believing Christian. Um, I that so for me, part of my spiritual resiliency isn't just self, but it's also my faith and what I believe in. Uh, I believe in you know what the Bible preaches and what it teaches about, about Jesus. And so for in myself and my family, well, I guess you said self, so I'll just start with self. Um, I, I think of what, what makes me feel the most alive and, and that not in one area, just if I just answered the question, what makes me feel alive? Um, being with my wife, being with my kids, doing certain things, makes me feel alive. Like I'll give you another, I'll give you an example today, early today, I went to, I took them to Lowe's. Like what dad wouldn't take the kids to Lowe's or Home Depot, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And uh, I had my three oldest daughters with me and I had all the windows down because I'm that person. I don't ride, I don't do AC. I roll windows down if it's like hundred degrees outside. I had all the windows down and we're going down the highway and they're just laughing and giggling uh my so in my back seat i have my fifth not my fifth my five-year-old my four-year-old and like my one and a half year old and they're all back there just lift giggling and laughing hairs flying all over the place and i was like man it's great to be a dad you know and i was like this is so cool you know we're jamming out to some techno just some beats and <laughs> stuff like that and they're they just have they're having a ball i was actually going to ask what were you listening to so techno oh boy uh, Calvin Harris actually was one of us. Okay. He's got some good beats. He's got some good beats. And that just, so that, that's one instance where, um, I'm doing things and seeing things that give me life. Give, you know, it's, uh, I build spiritual resiliency and spending time with family in that way. But for me, for Devin, some things I like to do when I don't, you know, just you peel back the layers and it's just me. I, I like to kind of be alone outside sometimes. Uh, that's where I also feel the most connected to God. And uh, I, I listen to um, this preacher. You might have heard him. Pretty, pretty popular guy, Matt Chandler. Uh, Matt Chandler is a pastor out in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he asked this question one time in one of his sermons that said, um, when do you feel like most connected to God? When you feel like you can have the best conversation and you can also listen the most and you just feel like uh, for someone that's believing in the Bible and Jesus, when do you feel most connected? And I, I was like, man, that's a good question. When do I feel like the most time or I, I can listen the best or um, just really just talk with God when I want to just reveal whatever I'm feeling and thinking. And it's when I'm outside, I'm in the woods. I'm in the woods, not like down the street and in the parking lot or whatever. It's like uh -huh. in the woods by myself on a walk on the bike. I don't run because that's the lane, even though the Air Force <laughs> makes us do it. <laughs> uh, uh, if I'm mountain biking or on a walk, hiking, whatever, and just being outside and just like, I know, it's just feel peace. It gives me life to, to do stuff like that. So uh, being outside earlier, I was working on this this tree house or just raking the leaves in the yard, just having some time outside to myself is peaceful to me. 
And uh, I, I'd make sure I put that in my life to do stuff like that. Okay. And, and you said that with your family, with regards to your family, mm-hmm. building resiliency, allowing them to have those mount, moments laughing, allowing them you know, in the back of the truck, yeah. just laughing. What other ways do you build resiliency, spiritual resiliency within your family? So I didn't mention my wife. And I don't want people to think like, who does he care about his wife? <laughs> um, our time and every spouse or every couple out there that has kids, especially kids, knows how important it is to have that time together as a husband and wife or spouse and spouse. Uh, for me, I believe it's um, that alone time together away from kids. Because sometimes it'll be hard. You love your kids. You know, they're, they're yours. They came from you. Mm-hmm. But um, I also like my wife. <laughs> I like spending time with her and, ha- and not just be about, hey, who changed the diaper? All right, does she need a bottle? And why are they crying? You know, having an adult conversation. So, well, and that, that you bring up a really good point. Liking versus loving, because you can you can all day long say that you love them, you love them, you love them. There's sometimes like with my child, I don't like my child. I still <laughs> love him. Right. Absolutely. I still love him, but yeah. I don't like him right now. And that's so that makes a very valid point. You like your wife. At the same time, you'll always love her. But there's times where even your spouse, for me, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak on your behalf. <laughs> on, for me, I don't like that because you know whatever that moment is that we're going through, right? Mm-hmm. I will constantly and forever love her. But sorry, oh, you brought up a really good point. So I got, I had to, no, I had no. to piggyback on that. I was like, oh, what did I say? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I'll definitely love my wife, but I like, I like her, so I want to be with her. You know, I want to spend time with her, not just talk about the boring adult things. Um, so we like, we're very strict on bedtime with our kids. So like seven or three, you get in that room, go to sleep. Uh, yeah, I don't care if you go, actually, I don't care if you go to sleep, but you stay in your bed, you read a book or look out the window or stare at each other. Cause my, my oldest two and my youngest two are in the same room. So I'm like, Hey, seven thirty, don't you come out of that room <laughs> until it's morning time. Cause when they go to bed, me and my wife, we like to spend time together, whatever that is. It's, um, sometimes we go out on our back patio and we just sit out there. I'll drink a beer, show the glass of wine. We'll just talk about the day. And it won't be about diapers and bottles and, you know, things like that. <laughs> or we'll watch a movie. Last night we watched a movie on the couch. It's nice to just kind of kick back and relax and do things with her that we both enjoy. And then, you got to take a deep breath and go, ah. you know, and just, and just enjoy being together. Um, we also like, um, I was trying to think of more of another way. I think you also need to know your spouse. You don't mm-hmm. have to know what they're thinking because um, no one can read people's minds. But knowing what your spouse enjoys um, and co- if they're a compliment, person that like compliments or kind gestures for me and my wife, but our love languages, for example, are, um, I'm blanking now. I can think of it in my head. Acts of service and acts of service and quality time. So QT. And I think all this kind of plays into our spiritual resiliency. And if I'm paying attention to my wife, I can notice when, and the key is there if I'm paying attention (laughs) Sometimes hard to pay attention in life. If like I can see she's off, not like mad, but she doesn't seem like she's full of life right now. Like, yeah, you know, when I go to the store, I know, for example, she loves Mexican cups, the the real deal made of pure sugar cane, and Home Depot happens to sell them. I don't know why it's very random, but when I go to Home Depot to get a bunch of wood or whatever, I'm like, I'm gonna grab one of those bad boys, <laughs> and I'm surprised her with a coat when I get home and she's like, Oh my gosh, you do love me. You brought me a coke, you know, or something like that. So, <laughs> you know, just little ways like that. I'm just talking to her when the kids go to bed, like, Hey, are you good? Like, is there anything going on? You, know, like, you want to talk about anything? You know, something like that. Those little things. And, but also for us as, you know, followers of Jesus, you know, and this is our family. My our thing, I feel like um, as the, the, I would believe that I'm the leader of the house. I don't believe I'm more important than my wife, but as the man, I 
I want to check in on her. So like, well, I'll encourage us to you know, like, hey, let's pray about something. We need to pray about this. And, and hopefully that will encourage her to also want to pray in her time alone. And we can just be real and talk to each other about things and go to God for things that we need or don't need just to say, hey, we're super blessed. We should thank God that we have all of this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the investment part. Yeah. That's that's the investment. When you when you invest in the relationship, you create the atmosphere where you can feel free and open about talking about those things that you're going through and and leaves your spouse with an opening to be able to to say, here's how I'm feeling. So it's yeah. it's good. It's 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 investment. And it's one of the biggest investments that you can make in your life is to invest in other people. So that's yourself, your family. But what about your team at work? Like how does how does who Devin is at home and in transition over to spiritual resiliency within your team that you're operating in? So normally uh, when I'm around people, uh, so I'm gonna give you a quick quick background. So I mentioned earlier that I was supposed to go to Germany. Uh, I applied to be an eight tango or a PV instructor for the German equivalent of their non-commissioned officer academy. Um, and I'm trying to remember why I'm telling you this real quick. Okay. And so I had to go to language training uh, for eight months to learn German. So when I was doing that, I was just by myself. I wasn't leading anybody. And so that, I would say that took up about a year with PCS and EFMP holding up some stuff. Before that, I was the command chief exec for our command chief down in Patrick era space force base again uh, i wasn't really in charge of anyone although i told a whole bunch of chiefs and colonels what to do based on what the command chief told me to say but i wasn't like leading anybody so it's been a minute since i've been in charge of someone or supervised someone uh so before that was actually when i was the ncic of our comm shop at patrick so before covid started is the last time i i led somebody wow. But, and that's when I, about that time is when I started realizing, like, I may probably should change how I lead and talk to people and give feedback and stuff like that. Um, but checking in the resilience of people, I, I struggled as a young staff sergeant to, like, remember personal facts about people. I, I would remember you're married or I remember where you're from or whatever, but. Uh, you you probably remember Master Sergeant Peters. Oh yeah, Master Sergeant Retired Peters. Now, I actually ran into Ryan him. Ryan Peters. That's right. I actually ran into him at the the Gateway uh, Church. Um, he talked to me one day. And he was like, "I was like, how, how do you remember all these things about people? Like, you remember his wife's sister went to have surgery somewhere? I'm like, how, what what the heck? Are you like just amazing at remembering things?" He's like, come here. He pulled me to the office and he's like, no, I am not. But, and he pulled this, this like one page document. He's like, these are all the people I supervise. I wrote down the names of the kids and every once in a while I'll whip it up and, or, you know, open it up and look at it. And then I'll go and just, hey, how's, how is Karen doing? Or how's, how's Bill? Or, you know, I'm just making a random. Wow. Names. And I'm like, it's a genius. <laughs> you know, but it took me a while to like, apply that but i remember that i remember you know or like if someone had a birthday or someone's going through something or hey they have the surgery or their their kid has a rec recital the kid's got a soccer game and then the following monday like hey how did little johnny do with their soccer game or how is such and such so building up that spiritual resiliency in the team and maybe that doesn't have anything to do with spiritual resiliency but no, I think it does. Uh, I think know, it does one hundred percent. Showing people that they matter, and if you also recognize in people, if they don't feel like, if it, from an outside perspective, if you look at your team and you're like something's going on, you'll eventually know your team. You'll know what makes the tick happy and sad, and yada yada yada, and who gets along with who, and what do they like to do, and hopefully you should pick up on those things and being able to identify when they're not themselves and they don't seem like they're full of life. Being able to identify that and not really necessarily fixing it because you can't fix people in their life, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. just showing that you care. 
I think that that's something. Absolutely. You know, I always wondered that about Master Sergeant Peters, how he did that. So I never, I never knew because, you know, we were both in the same section with him as our instructor supervisor. I had no clue that that's something that he kept because I always wondered how he knew Lena's name. Everybody else always used to get it wrong. They used to call her Linda. I'm like, no, it's (laughs) Lena. Yeah. uh, And I thought, I just thought it was cool. I was like, I thought that's cheap. You can't understand. You just got to remember from your heart. You know, like, no, that's just not happening, especially if you lead a lot of people. Well, and you have a very valid point there with, with the fact that he truly showed what it was to care. Like to to genuinely care. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't a pretend thing with with him. And and I have carried that on with my people. You know, I tell them I can't I can't tell you how to care, but I can show you. Mm-hmm. That's that's the difference. So Devin, why don't you give us a time? I know that you could pick plenty. And and folks, you all you all did not know Devin before he was married. You didn't know him before he had kids. Like the man that you're listening to, that that some of you are able to see. Uh, is someone that is completely different from the individual that I knew. He's so much worse now. <laughs> He's so much worse. Oh my gosh. No, you're like, you're so much better. Like you actually, just to hear you talk about your kids, a uh, couple of, what was it about a year and a half ago or so I was down in Florida yeah, for, yeah. for a deal. And Devin and I went out for cigars uh, at one of these little places and just listening to him, you could see the love that he had for his kids on his face. Like you could just see when he talked about his children. And at that time, I wasn't a father. I we had I just started about your son. Yeah. We had just started the adoption process. And and now seeing who and how he was talking about his girls is how I talk about my son now. So you don't know what somebody's going through in, until until you go through it yourself. And, and you get to, now I see that joy in my face. I feel it in my face when I talk about my kids. So huge thing uh, that I got from you. But can you walk us through a moment where you had to rely solely on that spiritual pillar to make it through something that happened that that could have taken you one of two directions? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll give you, you said one. I'll give you a little bit of, one and then a lot of another one. Perfect. Uh, so being an MTI when I was there, um, it was that was probably number two as far as uh, struggles or hard times, I should say. Not the entire time, but there was a, I had a couple of AMRs against me during my time there, um, and that's a you get so used to acronyms you forgot what they actually mean. Um, the heck? It's basically an accusation that you, you did something you weren't supposed to do, whether it was not like a horrible thing or criminal, but like you just you didn't do the rules. And so there's airman, you know, sure. airman mistreatment report or something like airman that. something. Yeah. Misconduct report. Yeah. I don't know. Basically, it's like, hey, supposedly a trainee said you uh, you didn't let them go get their patio break. So we got to make sure we're going to investigate. Make sure you'd actually, you did or you didn't. We'll find out. So I actually had a couple of those against me and I got some paperwork, a couple of letter counselings. I had a couple of letter admonishments. I actually ended up with the big shebang, the letter reprimand before I got out of there. I actually left BMT without a declaration. And that was pretty, it was pretty rough. It's pretty rough. Um, that was, you know, I talked earlier about having those blows and I was like, unfortunately I've had a couple of them where I was like, Ooh, maybe it's me. That was that was one where I was like, dang, what the heck? Um, so I had a couple of those down there. That was pretty hard time. I, I remember being pretty bitter. I was like, I'm ready to get the heck out of here. Peace. Um, now I wish I could go back and try again, like a round two, a chance of being uh, redeemed. But the time I really want to talk about um, is with my fam. So when I was at Patrick, Space Force Base. I keep wanting to call Patrick Air Force Base. I'm trying to be real. It's, I, I left just before, just after they said Patrick it, Space. It Force still Force. is. It still right. is. No. It's Patrick. Go with it. Go. And uh, this uh, opportunity came up on AMS for this Germany position. I was like, this sounds pretty cool. I want to. You can go teach Germans in their schoolhouse. Awesome. I want to do this. So I taught my wife, like any good spouse would do like, Hey, before I change all of our lives, does this sound good with you? 
And uh, she was kind of like, yeah, yeah, it sounds, it sounds good. You know, she didn't say no. So I was like, you didn't say no? <laughs> Volunteer, click. Uh, uh, while we're waiting to find out if I got a pick for the assignment, hey, surprise, we're pregnant with number f- No, no, no. No, that happened after we found out on journey. So about a month later, we got found out that we were, I got selected. I'm like, no freaking way. I got selected for this job. Awesome. They're like, oh, yeah, you, you, you actually got to go learn German first. I'm like, oh, I didn't. I didn't know that. I've never learned another language. I, I know oh I know Southern and I know English. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> since I'm from Alabama. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, let's let's do that. And so uh, that's I went to DLI Washington or the Defense Language Institute at Washington, DC. Uh, the, the school is so long, they actually PCS up there just for me to go to school. So while we've uh, after we've already found out that I got selected. Um, so I'm going to go to learn language and then I'm going to Germany after that. Family's coming with me the whole way. We're never going to be separated. While we're waiting to leave, Patrick, uh, we found out that we're pregnant with baby number four. And uh, we're like, we thought we were done. <laughs> you know, oh boy. We're like, oh, hey, all right. You know, and we're like, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll make this happen somehow. You know, luckily we're going to have the baby before we get to Germany. So we'll be in the States. We won't have to figure out this weird thing in a German hospital where no one speaks English. And I had just learned the language. Uh, so we're like, that's that's good. You know, all right, cool, cool. It's all going to be good. Um, so we move up to D.C. Um, and I think it started really hitting us how difficult this was going to be after we got there. And I remember both of us um, at one point being like, this is going to be hard. <laughs> like, it's gonna be difficult because we, even in DC, we're not around any family, mm-hmm. any friends. We don't know nobody, and we're not there long enough to like develop friendships with people because we're like, we're here for like eight to ten months and we're out again. Peace, we're gone. And where where's the school exactly located there in DC? So that's the next part. Um, oh. The school itself is actually downtown, smack in the middle of D.C., like a couple blocks from the White House. But since D.C. is still at that time, back in, when did we get there? February last year, March last year, um, was still like hardcore COVID lockdowns. I I did my class from home. Uh, So I learned German through Zoom for eight months. Wait, so they moved you to D.C. to learn German. I'm like, you could have you over Zoom? 40,000 bucks and just kept me at my wow. place in Florida. Everybody in my class, I had a class of eight people. And we're all like, what the heck? Why did we move here? We're just going to sit in our house. Anyway, I guess they were expecting us to go back to school while we were there. So that's why they wanted us in place. So I was in a, we lived in a two bedroom townhouse. Six of us lived in a two bedroom townhouse. Um, so my oldest three lived in, a, slept in one room and I, my office was in our garage actually, because that's oh, the wow. only quiet place I could get and to, to pay attention and learn another language. Uh, and then when we had our, our baby, uh, when Evelyn was born, uh, she slept in our room because there was nowhere else to put her. <laughs> so we. Uh, for a time there, uh, there were three of us and, and, and my, me and my wife and our, young, our baby in our room and then our youngest three downstairs. And so at the time we had a, a four-year-old, excuse me, we had a four-year-old, um, a three-year-old and no, yeah, four-year-old, three-year-old, uh, barely a one-year-old and a brand new baby, brand wow. new, as opposed to the old babies, you know? Yeah. We had a brand new baby, didn't know anybody, didn't have family, don't have friends. Like, we don't know anyone. We don't go anywhere because it's locked down. So we are all stuck in this place 24-7. And we were like, hey, well, you know, we could go to church. Well, like, they don't do kids stuff. Like we, um, Or there's no small groups for people that do that or home groups or whatever you want to call it because it's all COVID. We're like, oh, we'll just meet on Zoom. And we're like, no. And like, we, we decided like, no, that's, we want some human interaction, real like face-to-face, like can high-five you or whatever. 
and hmm. it was really really rough uh, i remember learning german is hard uh, i would spend luckily the class hours weren't very long they were like it's about six hours total throughout the day so about nine o'clock till three thirty ish um with a short lunch in between but I would have like three hours of homework every day. Not that they gave us that much, but I had to study more. And so I'd wake up at 4.30, 5 o'clock and just do German for like two hours, whether I was reading a new German article to try to understand and get better at my reading or listen to the news, write a little paragraph. And meanwhile, while I'm downstairs chilling in this freezing cold garage or on fire in the garage in the summertime, my wife is upstairs with the newborn and three other children. Um, one's just recently been potty trained. Once we got there, we got another one that's a, that can't barely sit at the time. Um, our, th- our three-year-old, no, not three, our third youngest, her name is Josephine. She's coming up on two years in August. Um, she was diagnosed with uh, every time I try to think of it, I can't, I can't think of the name. Basically she has low muscle tone. I can tell okay. you low muscle tone, which basically just, she's like a weak baby. Uh, and she struggled to gain her, her weight back after she was born. And with a low muscle tone, she was kind of behind the curve on um, where she be, she should be sitting up, or crawling, um, and eventually walking. And she was behind a couple months because she just didn't have the strength to do it. Uh, it wasn't. I wouldn't say it wasn't severe, where like she didn't have any muscles, but it, she. I guess I don't know what she's thinking or feeling. Maybe she's like, "This is tiring standing up. I don't want to stand up. I want to sit down. Yeah. Or I don't want to sit. I want to lay down." Uh, and so um, that required physical therapy. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here uh, at my desk and we don't know anybody. We don't have babysitters. We don't have daycare. So my wife has to take all four kids uh, to, or once we had Evan, we got, she's got to take all four kids to physical therapy, or she's got to leave the older three here with me while I'm in school, hoping that that they're not destroying wherever they are in the house. Mm -hmm. Or I hear someone crying or screaming or I hear a thud. I'm like, oh, man, sorry, guys, I got to be back, you know. Uh, and it became, like, really tough. Mm. Um, that was my uh, a pretty low point, um, especially for my wife and, and for me. Um, she never having a break, never having a break from – the kids, like if I was talking to you earlier, having how poor it is to we, me and my wife having a long time, but I also mentioned like I need a long time too. Well, everybody I think needs some sort of a long time, and she just never got that. And I don't know if people that are listening having kids or not, but like those younger years are tough. They're amazing. They're amazing having kids at that age, but they can be super tough, especially if you got several of them. And so. Um, just relying on things that made us feel alive, relying on God and our faith and making sure that we continue to pray and seek him, seek Jesus first was a big deal. So one thing we made an important thing, uh, almost kind of like our, our tradition while we were there is every weekend we would pick a new park to go to in the area. Um, I've never lived that far north in Virginia. I actually was stationed at Langley. That was my first assignment, but Way up there in uh, Arlington, there are tons of beautiful parks in the area. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so almost every weekend, we would go to one. And our kids uh, love hiking. And we would sometimes grill out. We'd take some charcoal and throw some burgers or or some hot dogs out there and just spend the day at the park. And it was just a nice break for me, personally, because I wasn't sitting at a computer. I uh, I sit at a desk and stand just like we are now, but every day yeah. for six hours in another language. And I'm like, I do not want to sit and I don't want to see any sort of electronics. And it was nice for my wife too, because the kids could run around and me, her and I could talk some and the kids were out of the house too. And everyone was just on edge. And so it was, that just kind of became something we did. So it just made us feel alive. We went on hawks, hawks. We went on hikes, uh, even though it was 
tiring and hot or cold or whatever, like whatever, we don't care. We're getting out of here. We're not well, going to be. Yeah. And you said one of your ways of, of going about resiliency is is being outside. So being able to also pass that down to your children to give them an idea of what they can do to de-stress. Yeah. But what did you do for your wife since since this time has now passed now that you know Germany ended up not happening? Yeah. Uh, and and you you have truly made lemonade out of a very <laughs> lemon situation to say the least. But what have you done to kind of give back to your wife? Um, before I answer that fully, um, um, I want to hit the point of why we're not going. I know mm -hmm. I said EFMP denied us travel. Um, so I graduated the class, finished German. Ich, ich habe Deutsch gelernt. Um, ich kann Deutsch sprechen und ich kann lesen. Alle. Um, so I can do all that. They denied us, my family, a couple of my family members saying they can't go. Would you like to appeal? So I had the chance to appeal. I could have fought it. And uh, probably about a week or two, I got documentation ready. And I was like, mm, we did not just spend the last nine months of hell to not go. And, you know, and my wife was like, yeah, we, we should go. We're looking forward to Germany. But I knew like if we went to Germany, how even harder. I'm like, we're here in the States where people speak English. And this is hard. We're going to go over there where no one speaks English. We'd stand out like a sore thumb. We really don't know anybody. And we're living off their economy. Like, I think this is like a warm up mm. to how hard it's going to be. And so I was like, maybe we shouldn't go. You know, maybe we shouldn't fight this. So I went to talk, got my wife and we sat down and I was like, hey, what if we don't go? What if we accept this uh, EFMP's recommendation and actually don't go? I'm like, I don't know what will happen. I don't know where we're going. I don't know if I'm going back to calm. I don't know if I'm going back, if I'm going to stay in 8 Tango by a PME instructor because I've already been to the school. So, I mean, I'm, I could go somewhere and be an instructor. I don't know what's happening. I don't have the answer. <laughs> and my wife loves knowing what's going to happen. I was like, I don't know. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and she was like, I, I, I don't, I think it'd be really, really hard. I think I'd be in a worse spot. And I was like, well, we're not going. Then that, that's the easy answer. We're just not going. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, what about your career? And like, what this, you know, the higher ups, you know, or whatever, won't they, won't this be like a smear on your record or whatever? And I'm like, hey, I know, but even if it was, I don't care. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I, I care about you and I care about us and the kids and making sure y'all are all good. Uh, mentally good and spiritually good and so I, I felt bad with my leadership in germany i'd already said like hey it get denied but i'm gonna fight it here i am like two weeks later like hey <laughs> you know i was like because <laughs> i'm a, a one man show like i'm replacing one dude over there and there's and the country the german air force expecting sergeant wood to show up in like a month and so it's not like I'm going to blend in. It's like, you, you're the guy. We're waiting for you. And I'm like, but if I don't go, like, what's going to happen? Like, you're going to be empty for the first time in 20 years and no one's here because you said you weren't going to come. And I was like, I, I, I'm going to accept the recommendation. I'm not going to fight this. I'm not going to appeal. I'm not going to go. Wow. And so I was like, I love my family. They're number one. I love, would love to go to Germany and speak German and be like a stone's throw from Switzerland where I really want to go. Mm -hmm. But I can always do that later. I can't, I can't replace my wife or my kids or whatever it is. So I got to, I'm going to pick them. <laughs> so what happens now? And so now that we're here, luckily, oh, and so to add more to the twist of resiliency, uh, they asked, well, Sergeant Wood, do you want to be an A-Tango? Do you want to go back to be a comm guy? I was like, I would like to be an instructor. I want to go back to comm. I like being an instructor. Something happened like a week or two later. I randomly got orders out of the blue from Maxwell Air Force Base going back to the comm career field. And I'm like, oh, man, hey, I'm from there. Don't like the comm part about it, but I guess I'm not going to be an instructor anymore. So for three weeks, and I was going to be like an hour and a half from my parents. My, okay. I'm the only one to provide uh, my parents. Well, I'm an only child, so that's the only way it's possible. But 
<laughs> I'm the only one uh, to give grandkids to my, my parents. Yeah. My wife has a whole bunch of siblings and they got thousands of grandchildren. It's crazy. So for it'd be a huge deal to be like an hour and a half for the first time in 14 years from my family. So to add more on to like the craziness of it, um, three weeks go by. We're like telling everyone we're going to Alabama, baby. Roll tide. We're going to go to the games. Hey, I see the first one's in August. Hey, y'all going to come down. We're going to hang out. We're going to go up to you guys. We're telling everyone. The few friends I still keep in contact with, we're telling them. Three weeks go by, and we're three weeks away from the movers showing up to pack our stuff for Alabama. I get a call from the EFMP office at an AFMP, AFPC, uh, which is where like the central location for people being moved in the Air Force is located. They're like, hey, um, we know you got orders to lack one. That was actually a mistake. I don't know. Somebody called, some made some backdoor phone calls. Do you know anything about that? And I was like, what? I was like, what do you mean I'm not going? They're like, yeah, so um, you're actually, we, we called around. We, you, we asked for the bases that you asked. Uh, we asked you to give us that you'd like to go to to be an uh, instructor. And uh, we asked Lackman, and they have the ability to support your family and the EFMP needs. So that's where you're going to go. I was like, but I got to have orders to Maxwell. Where did that come from? Like, yeah, somebody called and I had no idea. I never asked to go to Maxwell. I thought it was pretty cool. It was me from close to my family, but okay. Yeah. It's like, you're actually going to go to, to Lack. I was like, for real? I'm like, but the have, I'm still like trying to wrap my head around. I'm like, but I got orders to, to Maxwell. Like, yeah, those are, those are going to get canceled. You're going to get an amend, amendment here soon, the next day. Here too, you're going to go to the NCO Academy of Lackland, where you'll be a PME instructor. So this is the EFMP office from the AFPC that's calling me. Like, yeah, whoever wow. said that made those orders happen wrong. So just to add more to the chaos of life, it's just like, okay, now I got to call all of those people that I got super excited about and who I made them super happy. I got to break this terrible news. <laughs> You're like, hey, AFPC, would you mind calling my mom and dad yeah, and you, tell them that they won't see their fat kids? You tell them, not me. And we had been looking at houses. We were talking to realtors. We got, we got, we were ready to go for a mortgage. We were about to go down on house hunting. Luckily, we didn't do that yet. Wow. Yeah. So now we're at, we're at Lackland, back here in San Antonio. And I, uh, one of the things, and I don't know if this will sound selfish as me, but one thing I made a priority was like, I'm taking my paternity leave like, as soon as we get there. Like, I'm, I'm not learning the job yet. I'm not working on all these additional duties and, or whatever. Like, I'm hanging out with you and my family because I spent the last eight months physically with you, but I was occupied with learning German mm. and doing all that. So, like, I'm with you guys for however long I can get. And I'm doing that as soon as we get in the house. I'm helping making sure that you're good. We're, you know, she's trying to get a job now. And actually, she just got a job. Um, luckily, where she's working from home. Oh, awesome. Um, and we, they were trying to figure out babysitting or, or not babysitting, a daycare arrangements. My oldest starts school, which is crazy. Uh, this coming fall, she's going to go to kindergarten. And so just being able to just do as much as I can with them and, and the thing that she likes. Her birthday is this weekend. She's turning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> Smart man. Yeah, she's turning. Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to go to a restaurant she really likes. And we're just going to spend the night together with her siblings. She's got two younger sisters and their husbands. We're going to go out as just adults. And our kids are going to have babysitters. And we're just going to go enjoy the night. So doing things like that and just intentionally being with my family, not physically in the room, but like intentionally being with them and doing things that um, are good for them, whether it's church related or it's guy related or just fun and whatever. Well, and that's good. Those are ways to be able to get back to and give back to her for all the sacrifice that she has made in just a short period of time. Cause y'all haven't been married, but what, six years now or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Six you, years. You, get, you wrote it down, didn't you? Yes, yeah, cheat sheet somewhere. <laughs> uh, we're coming up on seven this December. Um, wow. You know, I encourage her all the time. She hates asking for stuff, so I'm always like, "Go have a girls' night. Go, go mm. hang out with your sister. I know you want to hang out with your sisters. Like you're close with them. 
You haven't lived near them. You're the only person to be taken away from your family. I'm the only guy that came in, married someone in the bunch, and then took them away. Yeah. <laughs> so like now that you're back, go go do stuff. Well, and I think that's important for her. You know, I think that that was definitely where you needed to end up at was yeah. a place that supported her just Take as much as. Yeah, that's a blessing completely. Okay, so one last story. I need you yeah. to tell us about the photo of you on the bicycle. Where in the world did that thing come from? I have seen it all over the internet. I've seen it oh, pop man. in. And I remember somebody showing it to me when it was taken. But tell us the story behind the bicycle photo. I'm still waiting for that to be posted on like oh, I know. Star the Air Force Facebook page or something. She's going to be like, somebody tell me who this who is. <laughs> <laughs> so do you remember Mass Sergeant Lindemuth? Oh, I do. Mass Sergeant Lindemuth? Yeah, she was in our section and she was retiring, about to go to Florida Keys to retire. You know, how miserable that is. And mm. our section's gift for her was like a boardwalk bike. And uh, and so we had it hidden out in the armory or not, the weapons pavilion, the weapons pavilion outside the squad. And we all had signed it and everything. And uh, they're like, hey, Sarah Wood, go get the bike and bring it into the Gosh, where did we meet? I'm forgetting the names of everything. That room where all the instructors met downstairs. Anyway, yeah, we're all in there waiting. They had her, and I'm like, I'm riding this bad boy. I'm not walking this. <laughs> I'm hitting on this thing, MTI campaign hat and all. <laughs> uh. I'm, riding, I'm riding this to the building. No trainees are around. All the, you know, like, no harm, no foul. And Master Sergeant, I think now Senior Master Sergeant uh, Johnson, Took a photo opportunity, snap that with a, uh, I was doing a, like a pass and review salute. <laughs> Perfect timing. Uh, oh, and, that, and that, it was a solid salute. It was a it. solid salute. One that's handed it. on one hand on the handlebar, the other hand popped up so nice and rigid against mm. that campaign hat. Oh, it was oh, beautiful. Yeah. So I, I posted it one day for fun. I was like, check this out. You know, remember back when it first happened. And since then, like it, to this day, I still get random tags. Like, is this you? Like, that's it. That's me. Yeah, you know, that's that's, I'm the guy. And Sergeant Paredes and a couple other people printed that out, blew it up on a canvas, and you know they signed it or whatever for going away, which is like pretty pretty dope. And so I had a funny, quick funny story. I actually had it hanging up in my tiny little cubicle. Uh, at Patrick Air Force Base, and this brand new airman walked in, or they were the sponsor was showing this new airman straight out of tech school around. It maybe like two years had passed since I was named town. And as soon as they saw it, they're like, That's you? <laughs> You're the guy? <laughs> yes. I'm like, I'm the guy. And they're like, Oh my gosh, can I take a picture and send this to so and so? They're not going to believe it. <laughs> I was like, You got to be kidding me. Oh, oh, I still get it three and a half years later, and I still get former trainees coming through my ALS schoolhouse. So it's kind of cool to be able to see the transition oh, yeah. to that point. So once you start getting those at NCOA, you'll know you're really Air Force old. I, I did. No, oh. I haven't even taught a class and I did. I, I showed up just in time for a brand new NCOA um, class to start. And it's day one for me. I'm just like hanging around watching. And this, this tender was starting kind of rolls back after we'd done introductions and he's like, were you an MTI? I was like, uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> he's like, you were, and like, I think you were my MTI. I'm like, I wasn't your MTI. We're, we're both technical service. Of course I had staff on for a little bit. And he's like, flight, you know, I think he's like flight 360 through train, train squad. I'm like, oh my gosh, you were a trainee. <laughs> <laughs> No way. I'm like, well, congratulations. You're here. You know, good job. <laughs> <laughs> I now did I'm something be, right. I know. I was like, I bet you're sitting there going, dang, I got to get out of this classroom. <laughs> like, this guy's following me everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I told them, hey, listen, uh, the Air Force is really, really small. And don't be afraid because I will see you again. Mm -hmm. All right. So usually we ask at the end of these uh, episodes about reading uh, what you're reading right now or any recommendations that you have for books. What does Devin yeah. Wood have? Uh, so believe it or not, I am reading something. I'm not a big oh. reader. I'm more of a doer. 
but I am reading a book called Didn't See It Coming by okay. Carrie Neuhoff or Neuwolf. Uh, I think it's, uh, it sounds like it's German to be honest with you. Neuwolf, it's this right here. Oh, Carrie Neuwolf, Neuwolf. yeah. Neuwolf. Um, and it's about um, obstacles, um, character traits you could run. I got it's obstacles, but it's mainly character traits that you could run into um, while leading. And so uh, it hits seven major obstacles. And I'll read them off because I don't remember. Uh, it's, it covers cynicism, compromise, disconnection, irrelevance, pride, burnout, and emptiness. Hmm. And so there are two chapters to each. Number one talks about it breaks. Uh, he breaks it down. Like what is cynicism? What does burnout look like? Yada, yada, yada. And then the second chapter is like, here are my keys to fix that or to avoid that or to deal with that. So it's kind of cool. I just finished the first two chapters. So I went through cynicism and compromise and it's pretty, it's pretty good. All right. Well, you heard it here. Hey, Devin, thank you so much for being on this show. Uh, today's episode is only possible thanks to my friend and producer, G. Frazier with 369sounddesign.com. Uh, Jeff has the hardest job in the entire world by trying and attempting to make me sound good. Uh, and, and having people like Devin on here is going to be even harder for him with that Southern accent, but it's okay. Cause we love them and we love, and we are blessed by the entire team here at the wartime leadership podcast. See you next week.